This video is sponsored by Squarespace. This telescope costs $300. This telescope costs $1,400. This telescope costs $1,900. And this telescope costs $2,300. All four are refractors with apertures between 86 and 90 millimeters and focal lengths between 464 and 560 millimeters. In this video, I'm gonna review these telescopes from a deep sky astrophotography perspective and I'll present my results from a one night shootout with the same equipment all capturing the Pinwheel Galaxy, which is a very exciting target right now because it has a new, very bright supernova explosion within it. And I'll say a bit more about that at the very end of the video, so definitely stick around for that. Hi, my name is Nico, and this channel is all about astrophotography, the art of capturing the night sky. And while you don't need a telescope to start out in astrophotography, because I have many videos on shooting with just a normal camera and lens, many of us eventually do buy a telescope because they typically have some advantages over lenses in terms of light gathering, having well-corrected optics for shooting the stars, and other features that a normal uh, lens may lack. The dollar amounts that I have in the title and the intro uh, for these telescopes are only um, for the telescopes themselves. So to get actual photographs of deep sky objects with these telescopes, you'd also need a good quality motorized mount, a camera, an auto guiding system, a number of cables, and a computer. And if all of this is new to you, this is your first video about astrophotography, I'd suggest actually not watching this one and go to like my overview video where I show different rigs at different price points and sort of explain what goes into it. And then I've also done other telescope review shootouts. I have one on 80 millimeter aperture refractors and another on 60 to 65 millimeter aperture refractors. So this is now an 86 to 90 millimeter aperture shootout. And the 86 to 90 millimeter aperture range is pretty great for imagers like me who love shooting nebulae, but also might occasionally want to go after a brighter galaxy like Messier 101. Since this video is a review, let me share a few disclosures up front. The SB Boney SV48P uh, was bought by myself with proceeds from my Patreon campaign. And it has been featured before uh, when I wanted to talk about refractors versus reflectors. This Founder Optics FOT86 was lent to me by Founder Optics for the purpose of this review. No money exchanged hands. They are not telling me what to say. And I will be sending it back to them after the review period. Same thing with this Apertura 90 millimeter triplet, no strings attached, lent to me by High Point Scientific. This Stellar View SV86 uh, Q, or SVQ86, I, I should say, um, I actually bought it in 2018, so about five years ago now, and it was featured in my very, not my first, but my second video on the channel, which is sort of like an overview video. I've always wanted to do a review of it, but then right after I bought it, Stellar View discontinued it. Um, they only made one really small batch, so I never really got around to the review because it was sort of like, well, you can't buy it. Um, but I thought this is a perfect opportunity to finally review it, um, and so, the only way you can buy this scope now is if you happen to find uh, one of the few dozen that were produced on the used market. I am not selling mine because I love this telescope, um, but you might be lucky and find it somewhere. Okay, so the first thing to compare with these refractors is their optical designs. The SV Boney SV48P 90 millimeter is an achromatic doublet, meaning a refractor telescope with two glass elements, neither are ED glass, ED means extra low dispersion, and the benefit of ED glass is that it helps control the violet halos that you're gonna see in a doublet refractor like this SV Boney. Uh, it does not include a field flattener, nor could I find one for sale from SV Boney for this particular telescope, so I'm using it as is with no corrector. Uh, and correctors just you know help sharpen up the corners uh, with a larger field. The telescope has 90 millimeter aperture, 500 millimeter focal length, so that makes it a focal ratio of f5, which is great for deep sky, plenty fast. The Founder Optics FOT86 is an apochromatic triplet, and two of the three glass elements are ED glass. They don't specify the ED glass type. They also state that the glass elements are widely spaced, which is, I guess, is unusual and similar to the design of the famous Takahashi TOA line of refractors, which are widely regarded as excellent scopes. 
And the company also states that this telescope has a well-corrected 44 millimeter image circle, so it should handle full frame sensors just fine. It includes a field flattener in the package. The telescope has an 86 millimeter aperture and 560 millimeter focal length, so that makes the focal ratio f6.5. There is a 0.8x reducer listed on their website, but I don't have that for this review. The Apertura 90mm triplet is an apochromatic triplet with ED glass elements, and they specified that the ED glass type is FPL53, which is a special kind of glass made by the Japanese company Ohara. They also state a 44 millimeter image circle for full frame imaging. They do also include a 1X field flattener in the package. And this telescope has a 90 millimeter front aperture with four, 540 millimeter focal length and that puts it at F6. Uh, lastly, we have the SVQ86 from Stellarview. This is a quadruplet design. It is apochromatic. It does not need a field flatter because the corrector elements are built into the telescope. You'll often hear these kinds of telescopes called astrographs because they're really designed for imaging with a camera, not looking through an eyepiece. This scope is discontinued, as I mentioned, so I can't remember all the stated specs and the uh, web pages down, but I believe the image circle was stated at 60 millimeters, which is plenty large. It has a front aperture of 86 millimeters and a focal length of 464, which makes the focal ratio f5.4. Next, let's look at the physical characteristics of these telescopes, and I'll go over what is included when you buy each telescope. All right, here's the SV Boney SV48. According to my measurement here, it weighs 2.3 kilograms or five pounds, one ounce. The design language on mine is pretty bare bones. No even branding here on the dew shield. I have seen on Amazon, they seem to have updated it. So now it says SV Boney right there. They also seem to add rings, which is nice. So you could rotate the telescope that way. On my version here, they just have a little bolted on uh, Vixen dovetail on the bottom. It does work just fine, but rings would be a nice addition. Uh, here uh, on right in front of the focuser, we have a little uh, Cinta style finder shoe. It did come with that. The focuser is pretty basic. It's just a two speed, um, I don't know if this is a Crayford or just something simple here. Works okay. It's just a, it's a little slow and sticky, but it, it works just fine. Um, it does have markings for travel. So let's see how far out this goes. It's a 70 millimeter travel on the focuser. Okay, the dew shield does not have a lock. So that just means if you put a heavy flat panel on it or something, you just have to be a little bit careful. I just recommend taping it in that case. Okay, the front cap is metal and it's a screw on. Which is not my favorite because imagine trying to do this in the cold at night. Ugh, it's a little tough. And the appearance here, I'd call this a semi-gloss. Uh, it's fairly matte actually. Um, but not like super matte. And it's a white with like a little bit of bubble texture on the coat. And then we have a few little gold accents. Mine came in this hard case, silver hard case, with a custom soft foam insert and sort of a bubbly foam on the top. Works out quite well. And uh, nice that, you know, they include this for a $300 telescope. Okay, here's the Founder Optics FOT86. Once you put on the rings and the dovetail, it, it clocks in at around 54 centimeters. It weighs 4.8 kilograms or 10 pounds, eight ounces. The look is pretty unique. It's this nice uh, gloss, shiny gloss black with green anodized accents and uh, silver, some silver hardware. You can see the uh, logo here on the dew shield and in a couple other places like on the field flattener. Front cap is metal and it's a little tough to take off and on. Uh, you can see here, Hopefully you can see here the inside of the dew shield is a nice sort of like ridged mat 
and and there are uh, baffles all the way down the telescope. Okay, the ring hardware looks plenty substantial. Comes with a nice sized uh, Vixen dovetail plate there. They have uh, three retaining screws for tightening up the dew shield, which is appreciated. There's a number of holes on the top of the rings here. You have a nice flat surface with, I think these are quarter inch 20 uh, screw holes. Okay, back here we have the two inch focuser. It does have a Cinta style shoe on there if you wanna use a finder scope or a guide scope maybe there. Uh, this top uh, lock nut is for rotation. So the entire focuser has 360 degree rotation that you can lock down right there. On uh, the bottom, of course, we have a, another uh, locking nut here for tensioning or locking down focus. And this is like a nice, really substantial one. I really like that, that it's like nice and big, very easy to find in the dark. The focuser is incredibly silky smooth, like the mechanics on this are top notch, really, really nice. Uh, of course, it has the 10 to 1 reduction knob. If you do want to add a ZWO EAF to this, you do need to buy a special bracket, uh, but it, it will work with the bracket. You can see here we have uh, geared teeth for the focuser travel. And on the top, uh, it does have millimeter markings for the distance that the focuser goes out. It goes out 95 millimeters. And then this is really unique. I've never uh, seen a focuser uh, quite like this one. So a lot of focusers will accept, you know, a two inch um, barrel or two inch eyepiece back here with like thumb screws, like three thumb screws. This is more like a, a roto lock system where it's like you, you just turn it left to loosen, turn it right to tighten, and then there's tensioning all inside there to tighten it down, like a compression ring. And uh, their included field flattener has like a little ridge right there where the compression ring is tightening down. So it, it's very secure. You don't have to worry about anything uh, moving with that, even though it doesn't have a threaded connection. So for photo for photography, you'd always be using the field flattener or the flattener reducer and uh, the matched one from Founder Optics. So this is very easy. Now, the reason this is cool is with a lot of telescope systems to go from photography to visual and back and forth, it's a big ordeal because you have all these threaded connections and spacers and all of this stuff. Uh, like a visual back and a photography back are often different things. Well, with this one, if I just wanted to quickly go from photography mode to visual mode, I could just take off the field flattener with the camera and everything connected back here, take this whole thing out, put in a two inch diagonal right there for an eyepiece and be done. Uh, you know, just tighten it and loosen it, and it's really, really fast. I was just thinking about that, that this would be a really versatile scope if you liked doing both visual and photography with a refractor like this. Um, in terms of the field flattener itself, it's a two inch um, field flattener. It comes with uh, connections back here on the camera side for both M48 and M42, so that's very handy. Okay, in terms of what else it came with, it came with a really cool inspection report that uh, is actually analyzing this particular copy of the telescope with uh, optical tests and you know mechanical checking, resolution test. Uh, so all kinds of cool things. It's signed by Emily Chang. Uh, that's really neat. And then it also comes with a printed manual, a nice little thank you and QR code for finding out more information. This is the hard case that it comes with. Uh, it does come with some foam. Uh, you can get it back in here, of course, um, but it does require taking the Vixen dovetail off. 
uh, so it's not the most convenient in terms of, uh, of, a, case, of a travel case, but it, it works. And you know, honestly, I don't end up using these travel hard cases that come with the telescopes that often because um, once you put a camera and imaging stuff on it, they don't fit in the case anymore anyways. So I really just save these for if I was ever gonna resell the scope. Uh, I didn't use this, but it does come with a top handle if you wanna put that on. And it does come with uh, this nice uh, roto locking uh, adapter for one and a quarter inch eyepieces. This is the uh, piece for the field flattener if you wanna use M42 camera. Okay, next up we have the Apertura 90 millimeter triplet. This one clocks in at 41 centimeters. With the field flattener in, it comes in at 4.8 kilograms. All right, the look is matte white. We have Apertura branded there. You have a, the Apertura A in the uh, clamps here on the rings. And then we have uh, these nice sort of bright blue accents. Like I said before, it has a Wasmandy style plate. It does have some cutouts to reduce weight and plenty of uh, holes all over it. On the top, we got a top handle, nice big substantial top handle. My hand fits just fine in there. Um, and it's a multifunction top handle, meaning it's not just a handle, it also has some screw holes and a track here, uh, which you could screw things into by putting a screw in underneath. Um, so you could put, you know, a clamp up here for a guide scope or even just, you know, screw a guide scope uh, right on top. But it also has a Cinta style finder shoe here on the focuser. The focuser does rotate uh, 360, the rotation locking knob is right here on top and on bottom we have a tensioner locker thing here for the focuser it is a dual speed focuser nice and smooth uh there's the you know the gold uh, geared track right there Focuser seems really nice. Um, there are a couple little screw holes here for adding an electronic focuser. I didn't try that, but looks like it would be possible. And then we have uh, markings for distance and repeatable focus up here on top. It goes out to 95 millimeters. That's the focus travel, so nice and long. Then here's the field flattener. It just screws right onto the back of the focuser. I don't know what this thread is offhand. I think it might be like 63 millimeters, something like that. Um, back here though, you have a your standard 48 millimeter threads. And this piece comes off and there's a place to put in two inch filters right there. The dew shield uh, does not have like a standard thumb screw locking knob. It does feel pretty tensioned though. So um, I don't know if you'd have any problem putting a, a flat panel on the front there. It also has these little micro uh, screws here um, for maybe adjusting the tension of the uh, dew shield. It has a metal front cap that's nice and tight, a little hard to take off. There's the front end. I don't know if you can see it, but it does have baffles. And the inside of the um, dew shield is a matte black for the most part. There's just a little bit of a shiny part up here at the front, but I think that would be fine. Okay, in addition to the field flattener, it also comes with this really cool little 32 millimeter uh, guide scope with its own rings and finder base. Okay, and in terms of optional accessories you can buy for it, there is a 0.8x reducer flattener. So if you want a little bit 
a wider, faster option. There's this available for it. Another optional accessory is a two inch diagonal. So you can take off the uh, flattener, put on the visual back, and then add this. And then to go with this two inch uh, diagonal, you can get a two inch eyepiece from Apertura. This is a 26 millimeter, 70 degree field of view. So a nice wide uh, eyepiece. And it comes in this very substantial uh, case, uh, sort of reminds me of like a musician's case for an instrument. It does have uh, keys if you want to lock it. And uh, you can put the whole telescope back in here. Um, don't have to take it apart or anything, it does fit back in here. Uh, as long as you don't have a camera or anything else on there. And by the way, here is the nice substantial uh, visual back, uh, which I haven't shown yet. Um, so it can accept two inch or one and a quarter inch eyepieces, and it does have um, a nice smooth rotation on there as well. Okay, and then lastly, here's my discontinued StellarView SVQ86. It comes in at 46 centimeters. In the configuration I have it in here, it weighs 6.3 kilograms, or 13 pounds, 5 ounces. I would describe this as a semi-gloss white. There's a few little red accents, but mostly just white and black. Uh, it does have a metal lens cap that comes off pretty easy. The dew shield does have a locking screw. I've actually uh, broken my original locking screw and uh, have been meaning to get a nice replacement, but for now uh, it's just a you know an M6 screw that I had lying around there that works fine for locking it down. Some baffles. And the inside of the uh, dew shield is felt, black felt. Okay, it has nice substantial rings with some holes on the top for attaching stuff. And uh, this is a unique thing that StellarView offers. These are riser blocks. They're like solid metal uh, riser blocks that are really nice. Uh, and the, the reason I really like those is if you get a filter wheel back here, uh, it's, it's really nice to be able to sort of rotate it in any direction and not have any sort of interference with the dovetail or anything anything else going on with your system. Um, there's, there's other reasons why these riser blocks are nice. You can put stuff underneath the telescope. Um, so I've always liked these. They, they, they work pretty well. They don't seem to add too much uh, instability to the system or anything. And then I had mine configured with a... Lozmandi dovetail plate. You can see at this point it's pretty uh, well used. Uh, I, this is the scope that I have used by far the most. I don't know if you can see that, but this is 003. So this was the third one of this uh, telescope ever produced, and I don't, I don't think they made that many. Um, in terms of the focuser, you can see I don't have a locking or tensioning uh, knob down here because I have added an electronic focuser. This is an Optec Direct Sync. And so the reason I like this one is because it has a little clutch. So you just turn it this way and then you can use the focuser manually. Uh, this is a three inch focuser that StellarView hand configured. It's very smooth, works very well. Um, and then once you get sort of rough focus in, you just lock the direct sync by Optech, and now it's ready for electronic focusing on the computer. It does have a Cinta style finder shoe right there. The rotation isn't on the entire focuser. Um, like the focus knobs don't move. The rotation is back here, which I prefer. Um, it's a little bit rarer, I find, uh, to get this, but uh, I, I like it better this way because then the focus knobs stay always in the same position relative to the front of the telescope, but the whole camera system moves back here with, uh, with this rotation knob right here. 
the connections are a little bit funky. The, there's, it, it, I think it's 82 millimeters uh, up here, and then you can go from 82 to 63 to 54. Uh, that's what I have done here. And then this, uh, what I have on here right now, is a 54 millimeter uh, Canon T-ring. Uh, a little bit rarer item. But the nice thing about that is if you want to use full frame on this telescope, uh, it, there's absolutely no vignetting unless you introduce vignetting through your own spacers and adapters. So uh, if you can find you know, spacers and adapters that have a nice wide opening, uh, this telescope itself isn't going to introduce any vignetting because the, the, the bright image circle on this is something like 60 millimeters. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. I've been using Squarespace for my personal website, nicocarver.com, for over a year now, and I'm still amazed by how easy it is to use and manage a website with Squarespace. They provide the hosting, and you can design the site however you wish with the included professional templates. There's nothing to download, nothing complex to learn because the website design system is completely intuitive and it updates live as you make any changes. So you can see exactly what your site is going to look like, whether it's on desktop or mobile. If you're interested in having your own website with your own domain, uh, like mine, you can get a free trial at squarespace.com slash nebula photos. And after the free trial is over, if you like it, you can get 10% off your first purchase with the code nebula photos. Okay, uh, now we're gonna move on to my favorite part, which is the optical tests. And here are the tech details of how I conducted these optical tests of the telescopes. My target was M101, the pinwheel galaxy, and it was a new moon, Bortle 3 sky. Uh, the mount was a Skywatcher EQ6R, which can easily handle any of these telescopes. The camera was a crop sensor, an ASI 2600 MC at gain 100. And I did guide these with the ASI 290 mini and the William Optics 50 millimeter guide scope. I do five by five minute exposures here. So 25 minutes integration for each shot. Okay, and the reason I don't just do single exposures is because uh, there's, well, there's actually a few things. One is that there's a little bit more variability while you can sort of average that out with five by five minutes. Um, another thing is some optical things like chromatic aberration don't really show up very strongly in single exposures often, um, or they're just hard to see unless you have a really trained eye. Well, they are a bit more apparent if you get a little bit of integration going. Now, I see it both ways. I see how some people want just the single exposures, but this is the way that I've been doing it with these uh, shootouts is doing small integrations uh, to, to give you an idea of, of the optical performance. So starting with the SV48, here is just an integration of five subs and screen stretched. And the what I'm trying to show here is just any vignetting that we can see um, in just a screen stretch. These are taken without any flats or calibration frames. So you can see the SV48 has maybe just a little bit of vignetting. It's a little bit more prominent on the Founder Optics 86. And I think that has to do with just uh, the two inch field flattener and, and the sort of the design of the focuser, but this would definitely come out just fine with flats or even a background extraction. Okay, and then here is the Apertura 90, and this looks super flat, very nice field illumination on this telescope, very impressive. And here is my Stellar View 86, and it's somewhere in between, I guess, the Apertura 90 and the uh, Founder Optics, maybe sort of similar to the SV Boney in terms of field illumination. Not a little bit of darkening of the corners, but not too bad but definitely the Apertura 90 uh, wins in that regard. Okay, next up, what we're gonna be looking at is, these were made with the script Aberration Inspector under Image Analysis in PixInsight. And what this does is it just simply takes uh, little squares from the corners and the center and the edges of the photo to show you what the stars look like uh, if we really zoom in on the corners. And so you can see with the SV Boney 
SV48, the corners don't look too good. And that is to be expected because I didn't use any field flattener, but the center looks pretty nice other than a bit of chromatic aberration. Okay, and uh, sort of the, there's a huge jump in quality here, of course, from $300 telescope to a $1,400 telescope. But I think this is um, pretty illustrative of what you can expect in terms of the increase in sharpness in the center. And you get you know much tighter stars without any kind of chromatic aberration on them. Uh, but also, of course, the corners and edge of a crop sensor are near perfect on the founder optics. Now I do get a little bit of star elongation, mostly in this corner and maybe a little bit on this edge. So that looks like tilt to me. Um, I thought I was pretty careful with the compression ring, but maybe not as careful as I could have been. Um, so just something to be maybe concerned with is, is there could be a little bit of tilt, but um, you could use a tilt corrector or different kind of things to correct that out. Now let's compare this one to the Apertura 90. Okay, so the first thing you'll notice is that this one looks a lot brighter than this one because um, of the better field illumination across the chip uh, for, an, for a crop sensor. These are not uh, rotated exactly the same, so don't pay attention to like trying to compare the stars directly. But in both cases, I think uh, these star fields look really good. You know, the only thing that stands out really is just, yeah, that field illumination and the little bit of elongation from, I think, tilt on the founder optics. But otherwise, I think these look really well matched in terms of performance. So I'm going to move this one over. This is the Apertura 90, and let's open up my stellar view. Okay, and this is a little bit wider field of view, so we get more of the galaxy there in the center. But again, I don't really see any issue with the stars here. Okay, next up, I wanna show some processed shots, meaning I went ahead and stretched them and applied some color saturation. And if we look at the SV Boney shot here, here's just a screen stretch, and here's after I did some processing. What really stands out are these violet halos, and that is just because this is an achromatic doublet. Now, if you don't want to use a filter to get rid of those, like a minus violet filter or a fringe killer filter, um, you can process those away in processing. And so here's my attempt to do that. Now, you'll notice that when you do that, these some of these big bright stars that have the really pronounced violet halo, the way that I sort of process them is just turning those stars basically white. Um, but but it's, it's very hard to uh, completely get rid of the, that violet halo without uh, leaving fairly large stars across the field. But overall, I think this looks pretty good, especially zoomed out like this. If we compare it to the Founder Optics 86, I didn't get the, the black background quite right on this between the two, but you can see that uh, the orange stars uh, come out a lot better. And uh, I think the sort of the overall impression is a little bit more impressive, but they're actually closer than I thought they would be in terms of zoomed out like this. Here's the Apertura 90. I think uh, this one with its larger aperture and slightly faster focal ratio gets just a slight edge, but they're pretty close. <laughs> I mean, uh, they're, they're very close in focal length. This is 540 millimeters. This is 560 millimeters. So these, these two shots should look very similar, and I think they do. And then here is the Stellar View SVQ86. You know, this is a wider shot, so maybe not as appropriate for uh, M101, but I think it held up pretty well. I like the how the star colors came across. Um, ooh, I didn't get the, the background quite right on this one. It's a little bit red. 
I think the background looks most neutral in this one. So my processing here isn't maybe perfect, but this is just to give you an idea of what to expect uh, after processing. And just to show you that even the $300 telescope, if you know what you're doing with processing, can look quite good, I think. Okay, and then let's look at some center crops. Here we go. And not a huge amount to say here. Um, <laughs> I think these three, the $1,400, $1,900, and $2,300 telescope all look very similar in terms of the amount of detail that we've gotten out of these, uh, the Galaxy. Um, of course, everything else is the same, the mount, the camera, so you wouldn't expect a huge difference, but I think these all look um, pretty identical. Now the $300 telescope is of course a little bit softer and then the main thing that's noticeable are these um, halos on the bright stars. I left those in for this comparison just to make it clear. You would have to deal with those in processing uh, like I did here. But um, going back to this comparison, what are we to make of these three results being so similar? Um, basically, the, it, it's that I think in terms of optical performance, once you get to a certain level of telescope, there's not going to be huge differences if you have a similar aperture. Um, so the main way I would you know choose between these three telescopes is the the features and the price and and what you're looking for. So for instance, of these three telescopes, I would still keep my stellar view quad because I just really like quads. Uh, you, you know, you don't have to mess around with back focus uh, with a field flattener. And they're just very convenient if you're if you're happy with, you know, having that one focal length and 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 don't really care about uh, the option of having a reducer versus a flattener and different things like that. You know, these two telescopes, because they both have 1x flatteners, but also 0.8x reducers available, it sort of gives you two focal lengths out of one telescope. So you might like that flexibility. And then there's also differences in just sort of the mechanics and, uh, you know, the look of the telescope, all these kinds of things, the build quality, you know, the founder optics, uh, I thought was just a really impressive build quality for $1,400, but the Apertura and the Stellar View were also just really nice. Um, so you really couldn't go wrong with any of these three telescopes. So it really just is sort of up to you of what you're looking for and, and those fine details in terms of the telescope design. Because I think optically, any of these are gonna really do the job if you pair them with a good camera and mount. Two days after I started this comparison review, which was again, May 17th, this image right here, we got word that a Japanese astronomer, Koichi Itagaki, uh, sorry if I got the pronunciation wrong, uh, discovered a new supernova, a type two supernova, bright supernova in M101. And so of course I got out uh, that very night that I heard uh, you know, it had been discovered in Japan on May 19th, and then night came later <laughs> for me on the east coast of the U.S., so I also captured it on May 19th, the, the night it was discovered, and there it is. It's very clearly uh, just popped into view here on May 17th. You can't see it here on May 19th. There it is. It was pretty small and not super bright on May 19th. So congratulations to that Japanese astronomer for spotting something like that. That's really cool. I don't think I would have, if, even if I had captured M101 on that night, I'm not sure if I would have been eagle-eyed enough to discover that. But then here is what's really amazing. I continued to capture M101 and just three nights later, this is May 22nd, Look at how much brighter the supernova is. This is a massive explosion. It's a it's a red giant star that exploded in M101, and it's it's giving us quite the show here. I mean, look at this. This is this is brighter than the core. Usually, the core of a galaxy is going to be the brightest part of a galaxy, but this supernova explosion, 21 million light years away is actually brighter than the core of the galaxy. It's as bright as stars in our own Milky Way. That's how bright it is. So this is 
definitely something that if you have a telescope or any kind of you know a telephoto lens even anything that's capable of capturing m101 you should go out and try capturing this because this is definitely like a lifer type event you know we don't get these kinds of super bright supernovas that often i think they said this is the closest one to us in in a dozen years and so it's really cool to see something like this develop over just uh, five days here from nothing to something that bright and the official designation is sn 2023 ixf and again uh, you can find it in m101 which is pretty easy to spot in the night sky because it's right off the handle of the big dipper and I've actually done a video called uh, how to photograph a galaxy with your DSLR that will go through the whole process of finding and capturing M101. And if you do it in the next couple months here, you'll get this bonus of uh, a supernova explosion. Now, after a couple months, it's going to dim again, and so you won't be able to see it anymore. So it's something you have to go shoot this summer, and, and I really encourage you to do so because you don't need a giant telescope to capture something this bright. If you love astrophotography, which I assume you do if you're watching this video, I think you're going to really enjoy my Patreon community. We are closing in on 1,000 members, and it's just a very supportive and welcoming group of astrophotographers. They're all very open in you know, sharing knowledge, and we do a lot of really fun things together. We do uh, Zoom calls, uh, monthly imaging challenges, a bunch of uh, private channels on my Discord server where people are talking all the time. And in addition to all that, you get direct messaging support with me. So if you have any questions, uh, you can ask me and I'll get back to you usually within a day or two. So I think it's well worth checking out. Uh, my Patreon starts at just $1 per month to join. Well, I hope you enjoyed this one. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies.